It is my pleasure to greet you on this 68 degree day and to welcome you to the commencement marking Friends Seminary's 231st year. I have to wonder if this weather is a reward for a senior year well done. This may be the coolest graduation of my 15. The hottest about five years ago was 97 degrees. Recognizing the importance of this moment, the first thing I would like to do is ask everyone to disable your cell phones or other noise-making devices. We gather today to celebrate the highly successful, humane, artistic, athletic, scholarly, and poised class of 2017. Over the course of their time here, they have revealed themselves to be an extraordinary group of young people, many with significant overlapping accomplishments. The commencement of the class of 2017 today will leave our classrooms, our stages, athletic teams, this meeting house, our hearts diminished and lacking. But as parents and educators, we know this is the cycle of things. It is right and it is good. It is the beginning step in the orderly, and sometimes not so orderly, transition to adulthood. Sixteen of you I've known for almost three quarters of your lives, and you have had the responsibility of being the caretakers of the Quaker values you learned in kindergarten and onward. Those of you who entered along the way have brought much to our stages, fields, and to our classrooms. We thank you all for being here and being part of Friends Seminary. Now I'd like to introduce the class as it grew through the years and built in strength and character with the addition of each and every member until it reached the 60 graduates you see before you today. We have 16 lifers, meaning 16 students who started in kindergarten, and I ask you to stand. Congratulations. One joined us in first grade. Then there was a lull until fourth grade, and yet one more came along. And we had one spot to fill in fifth grade, and yet another came along. At one point, sixth grade was an entry point for friends, and this year's class had 15 students join them. Please stand. Two in seventh grade. and two in eighth grade. And in ninth grade, we added an entire section with 18 students joining the class of 2017. They were joined by one in 10th, Two and eleven. And finally, one brave soul this year. You may be seated. This ceremony marks an important moment in the personal and educational journey of these young men and women they now become forever part of the enduring history and legacy of Friends Seminary. From its founding by the Quakers in 1786, and from your first day of kindergarten in 2004, this moment has been anticipated. 
Both the school and the class of 2017 move on one more step further into our futures, separately but forever intertwined. We count on you to continue to help your alma mater bring about a world that ought to be. On behalf of, I'm Matthew Annenberg from the Friends Board of Trustees. On behalf of the Friends Seminary Board of Trustees, we welcome you, the class of 2017, also now known as the 231st graduating class of Friends Seminary, along with family and friends to graduation this year. We are privileged to share this moment with you. Graduation is the day we really look forward to as board members. It's a celebration which reminds us of why we serve. It's been another tremendous year for the school. Our renovation project continues ahead of schedule. Administration, staff, and faculty have shown amazing skill, keeping school going strong, while buildings are literally torn down and built up over their heads. The excitement and generosity of our community is inspiring to all of us. Some of you may feel that the wonderful new spaces being developed in the school will be used after your time. But the best thing about graduating from Friends, or indeed spending any time at Friends, is that we hope you'll feel that your time at Friends is your whole life. Whether it's your fifth reunion or 55th reunion, we hope you'll remain deeply involved with the school and that you'll always call it home. A major milestone this year has been the 10-year review by NISIS, the New York State Association of Independent Schools. A distinguished set of educators from independent schools around the region visited us in March spending many hours with our administration, faculty, staff, parents, and kids. The school put together a document of over 100 pages long, which I won't read here, <laughs> outlining everything you ever wanted to know about friends, but were afraid to ask. We passed the exam with flying colors. I've been reading through the report from the visiting committee, and there is so much to like. The quote which made me the proudest was about students, and I will read that. By encouraging students, by, sorry, by encountering students during our Sunday hours, the committee student lunch, and in classrooms and hallways, the visiting committee experienced friendly, thoughtful, respectful, intelligent, engaged, collaborative young people in all divisions. In our lunch, in our lunch interview, students, student leaders affirmed what we encountered, Quaker values, and the school's mission alive in their service, academics, advisory, sports, theater, arts, clubs, committees, meeting for worship, welcoming of new students, and by extension into the neighborhood. Although few students identified as Quaker, they use Quaker values and practices for decision making, and they are aware of what they have gained through this aspect of the school. Our board has many responsibilities to support and advise the administration, to make financial decisions, often involving very tough trade-offs, to manage and grow the relationship with the organizations with whom we share space. But these responsibilities pale besides the big one, helping to achieve the school's mission. The nicest committee's comments about your engagement, intelligence and thoughtfulness, your sense of service and appreciation of Quaker values make us happy, proud, and grateful. You folks are truly ready to engage in the world that is and bring about the world that ought to be. So once again, our heartfelt welcome and congratulations to the 231st graduating class of Friends Seminary, class of 2017. You are the reason we're here, and we couldn't be more proud of you. And now I'd like to hand it off to Grace and Declan for their reflections. Hello, and thank you faculty, staff, friends, parents, siblings, and families for coming here tonight to share this occasion with us, the Friends Seminary class of 2017. For those of you who are aficionados of graduation speeches, you know that there are often important life lessons called out and explained at these events. 
At Friends, one such lesson has been placed before us not just once a year, but rather every day in the form of the school's mission statement, to engage in the world that is and to help bring about a world that ought to be. I'm a Friends lifer. That means that for 13 out of my 17 years of life, or for those of you who are quick with numbers, more than 76% of my time on earth, <laughs> I've been here trying to understand these aspirational words. And thus, almost all of what I know about them has been taught to me by people who are in this room tonight, including the unparalleled teachers and staff at Friends, for which I'm deeply grateful. Thank you all. But so much of my understanding of it, what it means to engage and to help also comes from this group sitting in front of you. Last week, our class and many of our teachers traveled back to Powell House, where we began high school four years ago as a mixed up bunch of freshmen who, for the most part, did not really know each other or perhaps much of anything else. For three days, we endured various community building activities and tried to keep each other's names straight. Fast forward to Powerhouse last week, and those of you who were there for that freshman trip saw a changed, truly cohesive group. While we may not have yet completely built the world that ought to be, I believe that our class has constructed the scale model for it. Something that happens quite a bit at Senior Powerhouse is meeting for worship, so that we can reflect on our time at Friends. During those various meetings, many people, from those who spoke frequently to those who had never spoken before, took the chance to share final messages with the class. Out of all of those messages, a clear theme arose, the sense of friendship and community that has been built within our class. While perhaps cliched, it is this strength of our community that has, in my opinion, defined this group more so than any of the other things we may have accomplished or for which we may have been praised. The first metric with which I'd like to examine the closeness of this class is the number of lifers. There are 17 of us. That means that just under half our incoming kindergarten class decide that they enjoyed this group of people too much to leave at any point in the last 13 years. A second metric for our community is that there are no separated groups completely unto themselves, which each new addition to the class, it became harder for those of us already here to leave, as new additions meant new close friends with whom to make memories. And quickly, those additions themselves became established parts of the grade and were ready to welcome and become close with the next new group to join us. One final metric that defines our class is what was said in those powerhouse meetings about how different our class and friends were from the other places people have been. A number of classmates spoke about how at their old schools, individuals were quick to judge and everyone was worried to be themselves for the fear of ridicule. Yet they all said they were so amazed at how willing all of us were to be ourselves here and how willing the rest of the class was to accept and support us as we are. I believe that it is this surprisingly close bond among all of us, despite our many diverse interests and backgrounds, that is the reason why the majority of the messages that came out during those meetings last week included expressions of gratitude. It did not matter who spoke. They each felt the urge to thank us for being there for them, for being open and accepting of them, and for making their time at Friends so worthwhile. I did not take the chance then to express my gratitude. So, thank you. Um, thank you so much. You are a wonderful group of people and your talents and energy have made the past 13 years so amazing. You all are the reason I would drag myself to school after staying up late writing an English essay. You all are why I would be excited to go back to school at the end of every single summer. In retrospect, those cringeworthy bonding exercises we did at freshman were worth the pain because they started the process of making the friendships that we all share today. And now, as we prepare to engage new communities in helping to build a wider world that ought to be, I wish each of you the best of luck in finding a group of friends that is as kind, smart, 
passionate, talented, and most of all, as supportive as all of you, and who will push you to be your best just as much as you have pushed me and each of us during our time here together. Thank you all again for coming, and please join me in applauding a truly special group of friends. Grace, I really hope that fear didn't get in the way and that you are graduating with no regrets. These are the words I wrote to myself freshman year at Powell House. When I was 14, I didn't consider myself fearless or brave. But when I think back to those awkward years, it is clear that I was 14 when I made my first big life decision. I had decided that I was going to jump into a new place where I knew no one, that I was going to start a new chapter in my life. Even if it felt like the most terrifying thing in the world. And today, I asked myself, why did I embark on this journey and all the other journeys that awaited me over the course of the next four years? The beginning of that answer lies in the story of how I came to Friends. As a middle schooler, I attended Woodrow Wilson, a public school in Weehawken, New Jersey, near my home. One day, I was invited to a very selective meeting for a program called New Jersey Seeds. This organization provides the resources for low-income families to help their child enter a private high school. The speakers described private school as a magical place where there were better classes, better teachers, better opportunities. In other words, a better education. I was one of only 10 students out of 60 in my grade that was invited to the presentation. This meant that about 85% of my grade did not get to hear about this once in a lifetime opportunity including my equally as intelligent and capable cousin James, who is like a brother to me. He was a part of this 85% that would stay in the public school system, that would most likely apply to in-state colleges, and that would live a life not knowing all the educational opportunities one can be given in high school. I, however, did apply to the program, got accepted, attended two years of both summer and Saturday classes, and went on to commit to Friends. Coming to Friends, I didn't know what to expect. I had yet to figure out how to ride the subway, how to accept that I was no longer the number one student in my class, and how to make friends that didn't share the same cultural and socioeconomic background as mine. In that first year, I was late to every class, I received my first B minus in English, and I learned that being different was okay. I remember asking myself if that was too Latina of me, if it was okay that I was a Jersey girl, and if it was okay to talk about the other life I lived right across the Hudson River. It was like this big secret. It was friends that taught me that this big secret of mine is what made me such an integral part of the school and of my class. However, when I say friends, I don't mean the institution. I mean the people. Because what makes this class so special is not the fact that they are incredibly intelligent or that they are astoundingly passionate about everything they do, but that they're immensely loving of all the different people that come into their lives. Students who have been here for 13 years took me in with open arms and welcomed me into their family, just as I was. I am so honored to have been able to grow by your side. The confidence I gained my freshman and sophomore years at Friends 
gave me the courage to apply to SYA Italy for my junior year. Before Italy, I had never been to any other place other than New Jersey, New York, and Peru. These were the limitations of my own small world. And by the time I left Italy, I had traveled to Athens, London, Zurich, Rome, Venice, Florence, and of course, the place I now consider a home, Viterbo. I grew to understand that there was a larger world outside of New Jersey. This world was filled with old ruins, one-of-a-kind pizza, catchy Italian music, and people from all over. People who came from the East Coast, people who came from the West Coast, and some who even came from Singapore and Korea. Looking back now, I can see that this was the turning point of my high school experience, of my growth as a person, and of the way I saw life. The life I was living was made up of thousands of different worlds, and I was going to continue seeking each one of them. So, why did I embark on this terrifying journey? Because I needed to. I needed to prove it to myself, to those 85%, and to those future students in the same position as mine, that it is possible. It is possible to achieve every one of your dreams, even if all odds are against you. And I am incredibly grateful to speak today because it means that I can publicly give a big thank you to all those who believed in me when I was still learning how to believe in myself. Thank you to the friends I made from day one, to the friends I made a couple of months ago, and to the friends I made just two days ago. <laughs> Thank you to my wonderful teachers that taught me that being smart isn't understanding something in an instant, but the desire of wanting to understand something. Thank you to my beautiful and wise sister, Briseida, who taught me that when life gets hard, you will always grow to be a stronger person because of it. And finally, thank you to my amazing mother and father who gave up a future in Peru, their home country, in order to give me a better chance at life. Because my parents don't speak English or don't know a lot about American culture, they were not able to help me the way other parents could. But they did something far more significant. They looked at me when I was the most afraid and said, we know you can do this. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Gracias, mamá y papá, por todos los sacrificios que han hecho por mí. incluyendo dejando el país que aman tantos para darme una mejor oportunidad de vida. No saben cuánto los quiero por siempre creer en mí y mis sueños. Just like they all believed in that scared 14-year-old Grace, we have a responsibility to help all future students believe in themselves as well. Thank you so much.
In this era of fake news, political combat, and thoughtless, short-sighted policymaking, one person in our community has stood out as a constant pillar of support, sanity, and optimism. Stefan Stanici has persevered and persisted in making his students feel as well-informed and comfortable as possible. As a teacher of politics and US history, Stefan has continually reminded his students that it is crucial in studying both to learn from mistakes made in the past. He has instilled in us the idea that history does not, in fact, have to repeat itself. Just because something was does not mean it must continue to be. Stefan pushed his students far beyond the typical historical curriculum. He taught us to question what may seem normal to not become desensitized to unfortunate events and malpractices regardless of how often they occur. He encouraged us to never stop being critical, to search and look out for things that we find wrong or unfair. He constantly reminded us to live in a reality based on the truth, to avoid getting swept up into believing everything we hear. He did all of this while generously sprinkling his sentences with his favorite unusual words, like modicum and galvanized. In and out of class, Stefan makes students feel comfortable to ask any questions they may have. He doesn't pretend to have all of the answers, and when he doesn't, he helps us find them together. He values curiosity, taking every student and question very seriously. In setting this type of teacher-student dynamic, Stefan became someone we could trust and rely on for comfort and optimism following the election. Stefan taught us that our collective power as students, as young adults, and as citizens is able to amount to a much stronger voice than one man's. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Please join me in welcoming Stefan Stanichi. Thank you, Tessa. Bo, Wendy, my colleagues in the faculty and staff, family and friends, and the graduating class of 2017. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be afforded the privilege to speak with you this evening. I want to begin by admitting that I'm personally glad to not be sitting where you are right now. I could not imagine having to navigate this increasingly complex and messy world as a young adult. All of the challenges that previous graduating classes had to contend with have only become more irregular, more intense, and more dangerous over the past year. You are entering the real world at a critical moment where the very idea of liberal democracy is being threatened at an alarming pace. In the past several months alone, we have borne witness to instances and events that not only defy historical logic and reason, but the basic principles of equality and legality as well. And before I go into how you should best prepare to face these rather unusual circumstances, I want to reiterate a sentiment that some of you first heard on January 20th of this year. Following the viewing of the inauguration and Trump's subsequent American carnage address, Bo had asked me to say a few impromptu words to the students who had assembled in the meeting house. 
Now, this wasn't the first time in the past year that I had been asked to make sense of this unfamiliar political landscape. On the morning of Wednesday, November 9th, the day after the presidential election, I was in a cab on my way to school. I already knew on the ride down that it would be an extremely difficult day, but I think in a lot of ways I was reticent to engage that difficulty. I mean, after all, I had spent the better part of the previous night fluctuating between anxiety and numbness. But on that morning, I couldn't escape, as I was immediately confronted with a question that I did not know what to do with. A student asked me, what happened? So many of you sitting here right now posed that very same question to me. What happened? That question, which was entirely composed out of fear mixed with confusion, was repeated over and over throughout the course of the day. Every time I was asked it, it was like having all of the air escape my lungs. I'm your teacher, after all. I'm an adult. I've explained so much to you in the past, I should be able to explain this. But that wasn't a day for explanations. That wasn't a day where we could cogently examine the intersection of all the forces that contributed to the results of the night before. That was a day for us to feel wounded together. So on that day, I struggled to find the proper words, the proper explanation that would in some way, shape, or form offer solace to young people made to feel so raw, so vulnerable, and so disillusioned. But by the time of the inauguration, I'd had enough time to think about everything that we had seen and experienced since November. And as I stood there at the lectern, much like I am right at this moment, these are the words that I thought could bring the most clarity to our community. This is not normal. It is not normal for a reality TV show host to run for president. It is not normal to promote xenophobia and racism as the hallmarks of a presidential campaign. It is not normal for a campaign rallying cry to threaten the opposition candidate with imprisonment. It is not normal to shrug off comments that imply sexual assault as locker room talk. It is not normal to threaten to contest the results of an election unless you win. It is not normal to fixate on inauguration crowd sizes. It is not normal to staff high-level cabinet positions with breathtakingly unqualified people. It is not normal to label the media as enemies of the state. It is not normal to primarily communicate using 140 characters. It is not normal to insinuate that your predecessor committed treason by wiretapping your building. And it is not normal to view the Paris Climate Agreement as a nefarious plot to undermine America's economic well-being. None of this is normal. So your first and perhaps most important task upon leaving the Friends community is to remember, this is not normal. And yet here we are about to cast you off into this abnormal world and expecting you to somehow make sense of all of this madness, all of this noise, all of this absurdity. The adults in this community have done all that we can trying to best prepare you for what you will encounter. But during this moment when we're all together for the last time, before you begin celebrating this important milestone, I hope you will allow me one final lecture to share three insights that I believe might offer a little more guidance as you move through these next phases of your lives. First and foremost, never ever stop being critical of the world around you. In a recent commencement address to graduates from Liberty University, President Trump said the following, nothing is easier or more pathetic than being a critic because they're people that can't get the job done. What an absolutely horrible thing to say to a group of young people. I'm here to preach the exact opposite of that statement. 
Being a critic is among the most difficult things you will ever have to do because it may very well put you at odds with mainstream thought, common practices, and the relative comfort of the familiar. But do not let the difficult nature of this undertaking dissuade you from what is your absolute responsibility. Novelist Gunter Grass once famously noted, the job of a citizen is to keep his mouth open. In these uncertain times, it is absolutely imperative that you heed that advice. To speak your respective truth to institutionalized forms of power takes real guts. And while you may be branded as annoying or a complainer or a snowflake, I know that I've taught you that critics are the true change makers. People criticize the idea that women shouldn't be able to vote. People criticize the practice of child labor. People criticize the idea that black people and white people should be considered separate but equal. And people criticize the notion that it was morally justifiable to own and enslave other people. History is full of examples like these. And history will be the ultimate judge as to the validity of your actions. As long as your critiques are based on the morals and values that have been imparted upon you during your time at this institution, as long as they are targeting the injustices of the world, as long as they come from a place of authenticity and genuine concern, take comfort in knowing that you are criticizing for all the right reasons and that you will wind up on the right side of history. As John Oliver said during a taping of last week tonight, and I'm paraphrasing for language here, there's no biopic where Liam Neeson beats up a suffragist, and there's no commemorative stamp featuring George Wallace at the schoolhouse door. Now, despite the absurdity of that statement, what Oliver is alluding to is the potency of history, its ability to inform the decisions that we are confronted with today. And that leads me to my second bit of advice. Continue looking at, studying about, and most importantly, learning from history. The most common misconception about the study of history is that it is nothing more than the memorization of dates and places and important people. But the reality of history is complex, littered with instances of tragedy and progress, of lost hope and renewed faith, of promises made and promises broken. But all of it, all of it is vital to this moment that we are experiencing together. You cannot fully comprehend what it means to exist right now unless you acknowledge all of the successes and all of the failures that made the present possible. The essence of history's importance lies squarely in its simplicity. What was past informs the present and subsequently goes on to shape the future. And if you're able to understand all of this, if you're capable of placing yourselves inside the history that has led us to this point, this specific moment, then you will also be able to understand what responsibilities you have in shaping the world that ought to be. Now, they say that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and there is a modicum of truth to that statement. But learning is far from enough. Knowledge without application is just thought. The responsibility is yours to take what you have learned and use it to guide your actions. I'm telling you right now, you won't get people to automatically agree with you, but you will learn a lot. And you will come to see the world as a spectrum rather than two seemingly polarized perspectives. But you must remain cautious. There are those that would seek to fashion a perverse version of history based on their own greed and anger and self-interest. Theirs is a worldview constructed from ignorance and selfishness predicated upon falsehoods. And to that end, my last piece of advice is to always value legitimate facts over personally held beliefs. This pursuit has unfortunately become an increasingly muddled task 
but perhaps has never been more critical to the maintenance of our most vital institution. The democracy that we hold dear, that we cling to in times of strife, that we celebrate in moments of achievement, becomes imperiled when ignorance and entitled opinion supplant facts. Any good historian will tell you that democracies are not achieved. They are processes, and as such, are prone to regression and failure. As a citizenry, we have covered ourselves far too frequently with the quilt of complacency, assuming that our laws and our governmental institutions will inevitably be there to protect the rights and liberties that are at the bedrock of our socio-political construction. And yet we find ourselves in a very critical moment, shaped largely out of our inability to perceive a collective reality based on things that can be observed with our own two eyes. We live in an era where we've become all too familiar with concepts like fake news and alternative facts. We have a White House occupant that is all too willing to pass off false information as if it were factually based. These are stunning developments. And as you prepare to go out into the world, it will be imperative that you understand what's at stake here. This is not your regular, run-of-the-mill, all-politicians-lie kind of thing. This is a fight between fact and fiction, between reality and fantasy that is at the very crux of the injustices that we face. We are being confronted by an apparatus that is actively seeking to undermine the collective strength when factual truth becomes the impetus for change. Look around the world at different instances throughout history and you will see a multitude of examples that illustrate the power wielded when a society actively rejects what they collectively know to be wrong, illegal, or immoral. And in so many of those instances, from Egypt to Ukraine, the collective reality-based truths that galvanized and energized populations were also actively undermined by those who sought power for the purposes of control, self-enrichment, or to feed their own narcissistic egos. Reality is not a wedge issue. The truth is not malleable, and as John Adams famously noted, facts are stubborn things. Hold fast to the truth that is proven to be correct, and always be wary of any authority figure that tells you to actively ignore the facts. In speaking about this type of manipulation, Historian and Yale professor Timothy Snyder highlights the dangers of a post-truth world. Step one, you lie yourself all the time. Step two, you say it's your opponents and the journalists who lie. Step three, everyone looks around and says, what is truth? There is no truth. And then, resistance is impossible and the game is over. So class of 2017, I turn this historic responsibility to you to make sure that the game isn't over in our lifetimes. Be critical, use history as your guide, and choose to live in a reality shaped by legitimate truth as opposed to ignorance. Know that the challenges you will face will be daunting, but not unprecedented. Learn from the mistakes of the past and let them serve as warnings on your journey. What I want you to do is to go out there, use all of the agency that you have, and write your own histories. Don't be afraid to scribble or doodle, edit, erase, or write too much. Just write your own histories. Resist the allure of ignorance, corruption, hate, and all of their ancillary demons. Write your own histories. I can honestly say that you are some of the most incredible young people I've ever had the privilege to know, and you have already accomplished so many amazing things. Build on them. Write your own histories. This is just the beginning for you. There is still so much ground to cover. There is still so much work to be done. Write your own histories. And finally, in the words of the immortal Grateful Dead, 
fair and be well now. Let your lives proceed by their own design. There's nothing to tell now. Let the words be yours. I'm done with mine. I love you all. Congratulations. Elizabeth Enlow, and I serve as the co-clerk, along with Matthew, of our Board of Trustees, many of whom are here tonight to celebrate with you, graduates and families and friends. It is t customarily my responsibility to introduce meeting for worship after we are still resonating with an extraordinary speech by a magnificent faculty member. It's a hard switch to make but it's something I think we are all capable of and perhaps are very willing to enter into. The Religious Society of Friends, Quakers, believe that there is in each and every person a measure of the divine, sometimes referred to as the inner light. Friends' manner of worship, a Quaker meeting, is conducted in silence, awaiting silence a silence that makes possible a deep calm, a profound listening, a possibility of revelation we might not otherwise have had. Among the many gifts of Friends Seminary education is the rare gift of entering into a welcoming silence unafraid. Silence is a fearful thing, but our graduates have learned to practice silence and be unafraid of it. Knowledge, love, and understanding require waiting and listening, as well as the fantastic education of this school. And this is one of the many skills our graduates take with them into the world. Tonight, now, after we enjoy Jada and Max's readings, you are all invited into this frightening but wonderful silence. Lest this feel strange to you who are unpracticed in it, know that any one of us may speak out of the silence. Pause and listen to your neighbor who has just spoken. Those of us who speak and those of us who do not equally participate in this occasion. And at the right time, we will close the period of worship with handshakes. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Jada and Max for readings. A Brave and Startling Truth by Maya Angelou. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet traveling through casual space, past aloof stars across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible and imperative that we learn a brave and startling truth. And when we come to it, to the day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from fists of hostility and allow the pure air to cool our palms, when we come to it, when the curtain falls on the minstrel show of hate and faces suited with scorn are scrubbed clean, when battlefields and coliseum no longer rake our unique and particular sons and daughters up with the bruised and bloody grass to lie in identical plots in foreign soil, when we come to it, when we let the rifles fall from our shoulders and children dress their dolls in flags of truce, when landmines of death have been removed and the aged can walk into evenings of peace, and childhood dreams are not kicked awake by nightmares of abuse. When we come to it, we, this people, on this minuscule and kithless globe, who reach daily for the bomb, the blade, and the dagger, yet who petition in the dark for tokens of peace, we, this people on this mode of matter, 
and whose mouths abide cankerous words which challenge our very existence. Yet out of those same mouths come songs of such exquisite sweetness that the heart falters in its labor and the body is quieted into awe. We, this people, on this small and drifting planet, whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living, yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness, that the haughty neck is happy to bow and the proud back is glad to bend out of such chaos, of such contradiction. We learn that we are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely, without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when, and only when, we come to it. Fluorescent Adolescence by Ruth Bamuame. Overqualified yet underachieving. It's singing delightfully off key to the radio yet pitch perfect in the shower. It's spending a half hour in the morning perfecting your messy bun. It's a gelling bedhead. It's lifting weights yet covering yourself up in turtlenecks. It's being a closet philosopher but blaming lackluster grades on not trying. It's tumbling, sharing, Instagramming, the perpetual pursuit of cool but aloof, hard to get, wit, sarcasm, invincibility. It's a cycle of hurting, fixing, loving, hating, wanting, lying, and then telling the truth. It sucks. But perhaps when we're older, a new set of problems will cause us to miss those of adolescence. So I guess we should learn to love the pain, since it's pain that allows us to live and love radically, feel monumentally, and smell the coffee, or watch the stars, or hear the music that we might later pass by in the rush of the real world. For now, we are poets and activists, astronauts, bloggers, writers, photographers, teachers, engineers, and inventors. For now, we are what we want to be. Some say the grass is greener on the other side, but I disagree. I say our grass is fluorescent. Before we award the diplomas, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Wendy Wilderotter's 16 years of service as the head of the upper school. We will all miss her sense of fairness, her objective thinking, and her dedication to putting students first. Wendy, we thank you and wish you and your wife, Deb, a wonderful life in Wisconsin. Michigan. Michigan. Oh. I, 
I think there was something subliminal in that. I don't. <laughs> anyway, come on up here. Now, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Friends Seminary and is approved by the faculty and administration, it is with pleasure, great affection, and admiration that we present diplomas to members of the class of 2010. 17, sorry, I'm having a rough afternoon. Will the first row rise? Are we ready? Do you want to sing the fight song? <laughs> okay. Olivia Danielle Nicole Alcabiz. Amina Asadi. <laughs> Edith Amy Astley. <laughs> Amalia Axon. Olivia Rachel Burke. <laughs> Mateo Boria. <laughs> Javin Bowes. Jared Bowers Hodges. <laughs> Elena Breda. <laughs> Lucy Gabriella Bryant. Morgan Blair Carmen. <laughs> Isabel Wax Clements. <laughs> Will Lucas C Cohen. Nicholas Ray Cumrine. <laughs> Kariah Ruth Danu Asmara. <laughs> Eitan Zeev Darwish. Will the first row be seated and the second row rise? <laughs> Tessa Maria DeFranco. <laughs> Adrian.
Eugene Dominic Moore. <laughs> Jacob Mayer Eisner. Elizabeth Hart Ely. <laughs> Eli Robert Eshagpour. <laughs> Esme Victoria Philippa Fairbairn. Isabella Marion Flores. Asa Glass. Moses Zucker Gorin. <laughs> Madeline Ann Hall. <laughs> J. Patrick Hickey. Rachel Sarah Hodes. <laughs> Kofi Daniel Hope Gunn. Nathaniel Hope Gunn. <laughs> Will the second row be seated in the third row rise? <laughs> Brian Strauss, Ireland. Jada Alyssa Jameson. <laughs> Yeshe Lakar Yagatis. <laughs> Jediah Evan Katz. Linus James Kern. <laughs> Michael Kwan. <laughs> David Max Lampietti. Violet Landers. Grace Lopez.
Petra Lamia Love. Bo Campbell McKenzie. Mood. <laughs> Fatumata Mbai. Alexander O'Donnell. <laughs> Will the third row be seated and the fourth row rise? <laughs> William Penzer. Jason Giamo Pitagorski. <laughs> Lucas Paul Pryor. <laughs> Morgan Jake Rosencrantz. Theodore Isaac Schneider. <laughs> Nicolette Rain Schneiderman. Schreiber. <laughs> Declan Woodward Smith. <laughs> Max Eli Tiersting. Simone Thompson. <laughs> Elizabeth Reynolds Valentine. Francis Weisberg. <laughs> Mason Brady Wise. Esther Wolchuk.
ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2017. the alma mater. Please note that the graduates, now alumni, will sing the second verse with any other alums who are present, and we will join them for the chorus. After the alma mater, please be seated and remain seated while the graduates and the faculty leave the meeting house. audience would please be seated and the graduates please stand <laughs> 